So now that you got in the right spirits with us, we've got today, as you know, three amazing, very exciting speakers, three incredible women that I'm um, really honored to know right now. Um, we're going to have a bit of a conversation with each of them. It's a, it's a slightly structured conversation, but it might also not be. <laughs> and then at the end, we're going to uh, have your, or accept your questions for them. We're going to start with Tanika. Tanika is a young poet and a creative um, and speaking word artist. And Tanika, we can start highlighting Tanika, I guess. Um, and Tanika is going to talk about, well, I'm not going to tell you, but it's going to talk about experiences of being an underdog, if she has any, surprise. And then we're going to just ask all our speakers about, um, because the way we came across, or the way I came across our speakers was through the BLM movement and through the, um, beautiful little bits of activism that they were doing so we we obviously know the big protests and stuff but i just wanted um well we just wanted our community to, to know that the only way to have ideas or the only way to um share your or have your voice is not through organizing big big protests so we want to just talk about our experiences um and how that can link to our art and how that can link to our own representation in in today's world um off right now just being everything digital so hi tanika hello first of all um so tanika is joining with bless her she has so many technical <laughs> difficulties and she's not giving up so thank you so much for that because i know how hard this has been as you moved houses your internet only just connected you're having internet con um, connection problems uh compute it pro problems which is why <laughs> she's on her iphone um and i just love that just love that you you know your dedication for someone <laughs> and something that we just randomly ask you and you've been trying so hard to make this happen so thank you so much um right straight into it how does this seem Okay. <laughs> yeah. How does this theme um, resonate for you? But don't reply to that. First, say hi to everyone and talk about yourself, <laughs> and then we'll talk about the theme. Because <laughs> I get excited. Um, okay. So my name is Tinka. I am 24. I originally come from Devon in England. I grew up in a little place called Plymouth. I've been in Cardiff for two years now and kind of become a poet and everything over kind of two years space and yeah that's a little bit about me and this kind of goes into the question i guess um so how does the theme underdog resonate with me so like i said um i grew up in devon in plymouth and plymouth is a dominantly white area so when me and my mum and dad when we arrived to plymouth we were the only kind of people of kind of color and this has kind of shaped everything. So for example, in school, I spent a lot of my kind of school time being told that I wouldn't get to secondary school, like I wouldn't go to university. I would be lucky if I could get GCSEs. And all of these kind of microaggressions would be said to me and it kind of like made me feel at the time that I would never go to uni, that I could never be anything than what everyone had painted. But luckily, I ended up going to secondary school. I ended up taking my GCSEs. I didn't pass them, but I took them. And then from that, I ended up going on to university with kind of no GCSEs. And I think that kind of showed to me that as long as you believe in yourself and you have that kind of passion, whatever anyone else kind of tells you is about like this big, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think that's what kind of an underdog is to me is like it, someone else may not see it in you but as long as you're seeing it in yourself and you're working on that yeah you can kind of do that and I always think of like the people who are like super quiet in your workplace or in school and you're just like oh like we don't really know who they are like what they do it's really interesting because when you go to the house you learn they can play piano and they can sing and they draw and they're actually an architect and like 
this is just one little thing of them. So yeah. And other things that I would say that come into being an underdog is kind of, um, one is being like a woman. Um, I think like that kind of makes you an underdog, I think. Yeah. Just women, society, women all over the world are so looked down on on men that like when we start doing amazing things, everyone's like, wow, oh my, but like it's always been in us. So I think that's a very big one to highlight because this comes through the kind of um, ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so um, I just want to say one thing about what you said. You said, luckily, I, I did finish or I did go through um, my studies. That, I don't think that was luck. That was you. So it wasn't yeah, luck. Yeah. And the people who told you was just being ridiculous. So it's just you having the potential, naturally, obviously, that you've had and you've just used your potential yeah. because what they said wasn't real anyway. <laughs> so, um, and yeah and so i'm like you learn i think like because we were like the first kind of um like black people to kind of go to school and to like be about when people have these kind of representations of you or stereotypes of you they just assume that every other little black girl or every other little black boy are gonna be naughty and mis like disruptive and like not want to learn so i was already kind of like tarnished and Growing up, I always wanted to kind of break that stereotype of whatever stereotype we have on black people, if that makes sense. Mm. So do you so think can... um, it's a lot to do with where you were? Because you said being the first black people around there. Yeah. Is it because of it's the time? Just, let's just clarify that. Do you think it's because it's a little town? Mm -hmm. So like Plymouth is literally at the bottom of England. Hardly anyone goes there um no one really leaves Plymouth so and it's a naval town and everything like that so most when kind of um most ethnic kind of minorities kind of come from like the big cities yeah so when you kind of go into small towns like I think people who are from Wales and they've gone to like the valleys and things like that would also kind of face that similar kind of just I don't want to call it racism but like that aggression if that makes sense okay. around and maybe we can say like ignorance or um yeah more ignorance. Lack of, yeah lack of education and yeah okay um so what would you say that because of your experiences um what would you say that you feel like you're fighting for right now or why right. i know i know that fighting doesn't sound like a positive word <laughs> so but i'm a bit of a fighter everyone and i put those questions together so um, this doesn't to say that we're all in a fight or anything, but it is just to kind of feel, you know, I, I do think that we all feel like we are in, in a fight with something. We all stand for something. And obviously we want to talk to you because we can see that you have a stand. So this question is about that. Okay. So for me, there's three main kind of objectives to what I'm like looking at. Um, and kind of fighting for it and that would come down to one the kind of the um justice kind of black people because we're still very much mistreated and people are still very much miseducated kind of around us and who we are and our culture and our heritage the second one would be about being mixed race because i'm mixed race um my dad is from the caribbean and my mum's italian um so I did a documentary in 2018 about being mixed race mm -hmm. and the biggest thing that came up in that was um, an identity crisis in a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So now I find like it's my fight to kind of help people who are mixed race find that identity, whether that's through their hair or their kind of skin colour or their musical, whatever it is, is just trying to get that kind of identity found. And then the third kind of fight for me is kind of the music industry within Cardiff and making sure that, that that is like fully fair, has females there, has people of colour there and everyone is getting fully represented. Mm. Um, these are my personal battles because I've experienced this through my life. It's kind of painted my life, it's driven who I am, it's kept me alive and it just inspires me so much and I feel that if I don't know, you can only kind of give that love back. And if I can do that, 
and make some little mixed race kids in the future feel worthy and feel beautiful because of that hair, then I know I'm doing something right with my day. Yes. Um, I mean, you know how I feel. I keep shaking my head. Um, you know how I feel about that because um, Tanika is our only speaker that I got to meet um, as she recently managed to come back to Cardiff. Um, is obviously we like Tanika is like a young version of me because I I'm mixed race and I grew up in a really big confusion with a Turkish mother and a Nigerian dad, um, and it's been a journey. And it is a journey being mixed race and it is a really confusing and non-spoken thing. Um, and parents aren't educated about this. I don't even know if the society is educated about how or what it feels like to be around mixed people or how you talk to them. I mean, the, <laughs> the easiest example I can say is that when me and Tanika, shall I talk about that a little bit, Tanika? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When me and, and Tanika met and we were walking down in Cardiff, we actually got stopped <laughs> by, and I think if we had walked a little bit more, if there was like more people <laughs> on the streets, more people will stop us. Um, literally like followed us to see what we are, <laughs> who we are, what we are, what are we? And we were just like, uh, what? Um, but no, but where are you from? So imagine that, and that was just us like what, spending half an hour? I think we were just like, whoa, two mixed race people walking down the streets of Cardiff. <laughs> people were like, what? One, we can handle. Two, what is going on? It was quite, um, quite a thing. We had to talk to people about where we are from like in 15 minutes. Um, so, because people can't ever figure out where we are from, that said, that's a whole another thing. The questions is a whole another thing. Our parents not knowing what to do with our hair is a whole another thing. Um, and then us not knowing where we are from and being also that we are now in a different country. So we're not even in the countries that our parents are from. And that's exactly. the same for most mixed race people. It's not, you know, I'm not just talking about my experience. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a whole thing, y'all, but we might have to just do one thing on that. And I'm really excited to see all the stuff that you're going to do and that, that I can contribute because we are, like, we are work, working or thinking or talking about stuff that I'm really excited about. Sorry, I did a little intro. Okay, let's move on because I took over. Sorry, Tanika. Yeah, no, that's okay. Okay. So, so let's talk about your work a little bit and... Um, also, let's talk about your documentary that you've done and the future um, of that documentary, because hopefully it's going to extend and you're going to do a new one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so um, how has this affected my art with being an underdog, being a woman, being mixed race, being seen as black? Um, for me personally, like, it's shaped my whole life. and everything that I've kind of faced before I was 16 was very heavy. It was very kind of like traumatic. I didn't really understand it. I was the only kind of mixed race person. I'm the only mixed race person in my family as well. Like literally both sides of my mum's side and dad's side, I'm the only mixed race person. So I was just so confused. And I was like, right, if I write everything down in a book, I can kind of make sense and I can come to understand who I am as a person or kind of just used it more as like a cheap therapy and then as kind of writing all of these poems speaking a little bit more I ended up coming up to making a documentary and the documentary was very focused on wanting to know who I was and if there was any mixed race people out there who felt the same way because mm -hmm. I'd never met a mixed race person before and then coming into the documentary and having kind of these conversations and speaking to all these different types of mixed race people, I kind of learned that there was no one speaking and there was no one kind of voicing these problems or voicing the struggles of our hair or our skin or how our family see us. That it just inspired me like so, so much more. And I think it's kind of overtook my work. And then the kind of Black Lives Matter protest that kind of kicked off in 2014 over the Trayvon Martin and death of Eric. I can't forget his second name. Um, I was in college at the time 
And this very much just inspired all of my work. It inspired my music, it inspired the films that I made, it inspired the like, ev literally everything that like all of my white friends then started to be like, oh, what's wrong with you? Like, you're suddenly like this pro activist and you don't like white people anymore. And it wasn't anything to do about that. It was more about me needing to connect and find who I was as a kind of black person because I'd spent my life kind of wanting to be kind of the same as all of my white friends and look like them and I grew up just kind of dominating white with white people that I just ended up using my art and my work to connect to my blackness and then it's kind of overtaken my life a little bit and now I'm writing poems and speaking and we have conversations all the time and I'm very very grateful amazing and you're part of ladies of rage yes i feel like it's really important actually to bring ladies of rage into this because without ladies of rage i literally wouldn't be on this kind of i wouldn't be here doing this i wouldn't be doing any of my poetry work and i wouldn't have the confidence to kind of do that so ladies of rage are a all-female um and kind of non-binary group for anyone who sees himself as a woman or a female and we come together to support to create and just make music art we dj we make songs we do djing we rap we sing like we literally do everything and we perform all around cardiff we perform around wales and yeah it's really 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 beautiful Amazing. And um, Marge, if, we got, if we have links to the accounts, if, would you mind sharing? I mean, you yeah, might, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, so my red is on that. Don't worry. Right. Yeah, our last question. Sorry, Tanika. Did you want to? No, it's okay. Um, so, how has BLM impacted your you and your life? I think you have touched upon that, but as we all know, BLM isn't a Black Lives Matter isn't a, a movement that started this year. Like you said, it started a um, few years back um, because this isn't a new thing. What has happened isn't brand new. It's not the first, it's hopefully is gonna be last, but I doubt it. Um, mm. So it's just that it's kind of exploded, isn't it, in the pandemic. So mm -hmm. how do you kind of feel about that? And what do you wanna add lastly about the movement and yeah, with the like black lives matter movement like i find it really interesting because obviously i feel like if you're a person of color or you're kind of black or anything like that you this is kind of already like naturally a fight and when i say to my dad it feels like it's more like a battle and like it's like passed down through generations and ancestors and like my dad he protested at the brixton riots like I'm sure if we go back into my history, other family members have been protesting. So it felt right for me when the kind of Black Lives Matter things came, it made a lot more sense because I feel unintentionally, like I've just always been so focused on kind of wanting to be more of a voice, of, not really a voice, but kind of just set a little bit of example for kind of people who are of color kind of around my neighborhood that like, I just find myself just naturally protesting about it. And then it's kind of, it's crazy that 2020 has been the year to literally kick off the Black Lives Matter protest because before we would talk about it and people would listen, but not as much as they are now. So I don't know, it's really interesting to see what happens. And that, I don't know, I, <laughs> I've kind of got a nervous. Okay. Um, so thank you Tanika for sharing your experiences um, do let us know if there's anything that you like that you want people to know about apart from keep an eye on you and your future projects um, and following your account I guess for beautiful poetry and you do share personal experiences there so that's why I didn't want you know we, there's no need to share them here but if people do want to know Tanika more um you can do that over uh instagram um if anyone is i have a quick question uh that they can't wait till the end to ask tanika real quick you can chat put it in the chat um before we move on 
Otherwise, we're going to move on to the incredible Tanya. We've got claps. <laughs> I'll do it. I, I, <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm Tanya Chiganza. I am based in Newport and um, I'm a portrait artist um, in the South Wales area, as well as being an architecture student at the University of Bath. Um, so I would say that does also lead me into the first question. Yeah, did um, you want to share your slides, Tanya? Because we were going to share um, your slides. Um, sure, okay. So, so the slides are kind of showing my work a bit, if I can try and screen share. It's saying um, slight technical difficulty. I can't share it as a participant. I think I need to be a co-host. Oh, sure, I'll do that now. There we go. Okay, cool. Um, I think that's working. So, yeah, um, I would say in terms of relating to being underdog, um, I can answer that in three kind of sections. As a person, as a creative, and as an architecture student. Mm -hmm. As a person, um, I kind of speak about that in a podcast that I host called Let's Talk About Race um, with my friend Rochelle. And um, them and I, we kind of um, talk about the different kind of experiences we've had as black women in the UK that are either really known about, like overt racism or the small kind of microaggression. Mm -hmm. And those microaggressions, come in the form of, uh, it feels like the definition of humanity in British society doesn't include me as a human being. Um, for example, employability, that's supposed to mean, you know, how worthy you are as a person or how um, acceptable you are. But in order for me to feel like I'm more likely to get a job, I have to consider taming my natural hair, or, you know, like what, which is what says, I naturally am as a person, um, being underdog means being through a school system where, you know, they proclaim to care about student problems, but as long as it's not about race, otherwise, you know, the ears kind of shut and they won't even try to fix it. Um, and it means, in Wales uh, more particularly, um, just a feeling of not being able to call it out because it won't be challenged because um, for example, when I work in catering, um, a high percentage of my colleagues are black as well. And uh, there was an event at a race course where it was a Bob Marley theme. And um, the majority of, well, not the majority, but many customers came with fake lock wigs and with brown paint on their faces. And it was a place where the black employees, you know, got, Still had to serve people with blackface on and that kind of sorry when was this <laughs> when was this it, where was this? it was very um should i name names because where, was, where like when was it <laughs> this was only a year ago or so it was very recent and it was like is this in cardiff organization. it was in chepso oh my days okay yeah was and, it um, um, was it a chain um it might be it might have been i can't really remember because it was like uh, just a one day job kind of thing but um, it wasn't challenged at all and to kind of um see your identity worn as a costume and know that no one really cares to call it out or challenge that that like really does settle in the feeling of being underdog um, and just kind of going through life like I related to Nikon like so many points um, experiencing that and um, yeah it just but I think recently like the sudden awareness of this is really encouraging um, and I've been seeing that as a creative as well in art spaces where 
um, in general, if it's not like an event or an exhibition which is specifically aimed at uplifting black voices, you know that there probably won't be that many black people in the room or represented. And um, that can give a pressure to kind of either represent everyone else or uh, reject that and maybe separate yourself from your identity in order to fit in that space and um, yeah I would say that um, overall it's not something that should still be happening I think we kind of know now like if there's a problem that needs to be fixed and yeah. um, the kind of conversations that are happening to yeah. I mean on a, on a sorry Tanya but on a positive note do you do feel like um, the recent a wave of BLM uh, movement and everyone almost involuntarily being exposed to it because we are all now stuck at home with our screens and nobody had an escape from mm -hmm. it even when we mm -hmm. wanted to. Um, mm -hmm. that, do you think that has impacted that? Do you feel like what has happened like last year <laughs> that really awkward Caribbean day or Bob Marley day may not mm -hmm. happen again because do you feel yeah. like or, or you are able to call that out now or your mm. friends are able to actually say, hey, this is ridiculous, while as maybe a year ago in Chepstow, mm. which is a small town, isn't it, um, that you may not be, do you know what I mean? Do you feel like that difference has, uh, is, has happened in you? Or Hugely, yeah. You? Um, I saw that um, visibly um, because I went to a BLM protest in 2016 and it was kind of a fringe thing and like the public reception was kind of like confused but now um the recent ones were huge like really kind of beautiful and radical and like it felt like the whole city was watching and so many more people were engaged and i think it is being stuck at home because we have more time to think and rest away from like the usual nine to five and um feel more empathy overall so now that you know we well i would say most or assume most people have had more space to um ponder on it like it we're more able to kind of reach across that bridge of like yeah. um that consciousness gap and kind of try and understand and learn more so definitely i think this is like a huge catalyst i would say mm, okay okay yeah. good to know i because i felt that way so what would you say that you are fighting for currently mm. um i would say um kind of to acknowledge how different identities intersect and to enable access um for people who are within the black community but also have other identity factors such as gender or ability um as human beings are more than just one thing um myself I'm a black person as well as a woman and sometimes um, those connections aren't really acknowledged so overall as an architecture student I'm fighting for um, people to have access to the profession because right now it's 90% um, white and um, I would say two-thirds male and as a profession architecture is something that kind of um, takes care of the world in so many different cultures and for it to be mainly just white middle class older men um, doesn't really reflect society and it doesn't mean that it will be able to care for everyone and so um, yeah that's overall what I really care about is representation and access for um, people of all identities. Amazing yeah. Um, yeah so now that you've mentioned your um being a student in in Cardiff mm. and nine percent a bath sorry in um <laughs> and the ninety percent of your schoolmates are white correct or, or your course um, your course mates it's complex because you can see in education um it's more diverse than that but as you look at the steps um it kind of gets more and more dominated by um white the white group of students in particular okay. so um 
if I kind of go to the next slide, I also have um, my artwork, but I think I can go backwards. Um, so this is the statistics for the profession. 90% um, yeah. of people who are like working in practice are white. Um, but you can see how that kind of becomes reality uh -huh. in education because um, it starts out with kind of a mix of people. But then as you go from the first degree to the second, it kind of drops down, like half of the black students drop out. And you kind of have to see why does that happen? Like what's about the environment that is making um, people not feel like the course is for them or they're being supported. And so um, at University of Bath, I started um, a group called Decolonized Architecture, mm -hmm. which is aimed at enabling access, um, widening the curriculum and kind of providing resources that people can learn more about um, architecture other than just um, Western European architects. Um, and so, yeah, it's more just like raising awareness um, and teaching kind of alternative methods to um, creating kind of these beautiful buildings that kind of care for all people, especially in terms of disability as well, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Tanya, thank you. No, this is really excellent. Um, as mm -hmm. someone said, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, iPhone. Um, uh, so I can't call you. You can change your name if you like. Um, but they have asked you, are there ways that architecture could contribute to BLM? Or they're curious if buildings and spaces could be made more inclusive. But I think what you've said kind of um, replies to that, that what you're trying to do in architecture uh, or the change that you would like to see is in education. First, the education to be more inclusive, and secondly, the um, your um, the oh my god, the word has gone. The, <laughs> the education to be more inclusive in the in not, not just talking about European history. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I would say to just include um, black experiences and um kind of um cultural styles that originate from more ignored continents such as um africa and latin america that automatically puts more worth on um kind of black cultures because you're actually teaching about it so you're saying that it's worth being um heard about and kind of using those methods instead yeah. of just western european yeah. methods um yeah and also more directly, it's like um, there's a decolonized architecture movement happening kind of overall and it's pushing for more black architects to actually be hired because um, if you're a black architect, chances are you're the only one in the room kind of thing. And so it's more just about employability, like actually trying to improve people's income as well as their quality of life. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Then, no, that's I'm I, I'm kind of blown away. So I'm, my my brain is really working hard. Um, <laughs> ask uh, ask better uh, better questions because I I feel like we're covering a lot a lot of things, um, of mm -hmm. how this uh, you know you've kind of talked about the podcast and um, which mm -hmm. is how the movement sort of affected it. You talk about your fight in um, being be more focused and not ignorant towards black experiences in architecture which is your field obviously that's your passion so that's great um i do feel like we need to do that in creative industries overall so i feel like we we have the same i think we have not same but really similar um graphics uh, or representation in graphic design as well um so just to just to move on how do you express mm. yourself or, or all of this with your with your art because you're an architect but you're also um a photographer and is it just photography do you paint as well um yeah i i would say photography is like a fun hobby and then more seriously i paint um portraits and so i think that um i just kind of went past that if i go uh to a previous slide Oh, you can see um, technology isn't my strong point. <laughs> it is, but you've got all this. 
So with my art, um, I focus mainly on my subjects are usually black women because I explore the different identities you can have within the black community. I feel like until recently, there was only one narrative about how to be black. And sometimes that's, you get that from other black people as well. Um, it was really interesting hearing your experiences as mixed race people, um, because I do see that sometimes is policing or gatekeeping about how to be black. And so um, my portraits focus on kind of um, how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive other people. So my Age of Woman um, scenography series is about, um, it kind of uses Victorian style art, like pre-Raphaelite paintings, um, when you see kind of like natural, uh, be like beautiful women with natural backgrounds. And I um, use myself as a black woman to do that because usually it's like, um, dainty, pale women, um, and that's seen as like the only standards of beauty. So by putting myself there, um, that's kind of automatically challenging that. Yeah. And then um, my favorite medium is oil paint um, and hyper-realistic um, portraits because um, to me that speaks to um, <laughs> the human soul and kind of capturing what like who a person really is. And then I distort them um, to kind of talk about how we can view ourselves kind of inaccurately or um, this one in particular with called perception is to do with social media and how we can kind of see ourselves um, differently through what we post um, digitally. And so um, overall, I kind of use myself as a way of exploring myself and also just kind of trying to represent more like intersectional identities. Um, and show that like black women can be more than what you see on TV and more than stereotypes that we hear about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, do you want to share your collage work quickly? Because I had a, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw that and I think they are beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. So with architecture, I do focus on cultural um, accessibility as well. Um, so I try and do that through decolonized architecture as well as my actual coursework. And um, so the picture on the bottom uh, right is a house I made for Frida Kahlo. And um, I can't as a disabled the, woman... Sorry, can everyone see the slight change? Because I can't see it. Oh. Can you change the slide? Can people see it? Yeah, they can see it. It's just me then. Okay, that's fine. All good. Let's go. Mm -hmm. That's okay. okay. <laughs> I, can. I can describe it for you. <laughs> um, so as a disabled woman, Frida Kahlo um, was in a wheelchair a lot of the time. And so I made it 100% accessible um, to acknowledge that she deserved to be able to go around her own home as well as kind of be in touch with her culture. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of people having the right to express themselves artistically, um, on the left, I designed an art gallery, but usually in art galleries, it's very exclusive. It's very controlled by, the, by those at the top and in terms of who can express the art there. And um, to oppose that, I kind of made it that anyone can design the art gallery in whatever way they like. Um, they can draw on the walls, they can put their own art there. It's, street art isn't a taboo, it is the status quo for the art gallery. And um, that's overall kind of what I try to do throughout my work. Beautiful. Um, before I move on, um, because I'm aware that I have messed up your order a little bit with, with the conversation, <laughs> is there anything else that you would like to um, share share with us to talk about? Anything else that I'm I you feel like you want to say before we go and in the meantime if anyone has quick questions just put it in the chat please um i would say overall um just in terms of the blm movement um it's so encouraging and i'd really just kind of ask to keep the momentum going and um to continue to kind of just have that empathy and um, overall in terms of um, that fights that you mentioned nothing is inevitable and 
in terms of achieving our goals, like anything is possible. So that's what I would add. Thank you. Well, uh, that, that's the thing about being experienced uh, or experiencing un, uh, the feeling of being an underdog, isn't it? That mm. you once feel that and then you do, you see yourself achieving things and then you realize, okay, that's just the perception. That's just something that's been put on us. But really, um, I'm not an underdog and I will not stay that way. So it's, um, yeah. it's to here is to not stay in as the underdogs <laughs> um thank you thank you tanya we'll come back to you with questions um love your work is let me see if there is any quick no just a lot of love for the project no quick questions but please everyone think about some in some interesting questions at the end um now we're going to move on to Thanks so much, Tanya, to Sarah. And I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, Tanya, could you? Yeah, you have stopped, I think, sharing. Thank you. OK, so hi, Sarah. Hi, morning, everyone. Good morning. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Tanika. Hard to follow. Everyone lower your expectations. Um, but in my work at the museum, I work as youth engagement coordinator. So I am used to following in the footsteps of brilliant young people. So I'm OK with this. Um, I work at the National Museum of Wales. I work as Youth Engagement Coordinator. So I am a little bit of a go-between, of a good connector, someone who holds the door open and who tries and creates opportunities with and for young people at the museum. And I don't have slides today, but I'm going to share a few um, links after I'm done talking with Melin so that if you want you can follow up on the work that we do. Um, I'm a failed artist as well. I, the last time I actually did art physically with my hands was in 2017, just before starting this job. But I like to think of creativity as something that goes beyond the production of artworks. So in secret, I am working on a giant museum intervention I'm trying to help young people take over the museum and that's a very creative job in and of itself as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I, go on, Millie. Um, Sarah, just in the, the light and the celebration of being mixed today, can you tell us about you, your mix? Because you're, um, you're um, mixed mm. like myself. <laughs> Yeah, it just, um, it doesn't, it's not that clear with me. And I think this also ties in with the question of how does underdog resonate with me? So I'm mixed heritage. I was born in Germany. My dad came to Germany during the Lebanese Civil War. Um, I am part of marginalized communities. So on my dad's side of the family, I am the first in three generations not to have lived the experience of being a refugee asylum seeker. But then I, we moved to Kenya when I was nine years old. So I grew up white in a black country, which is a little bit the reverse of what we've just heard. And there I did experience things like being very visible, being on a platform, having mzungu mzungu shouted in the streets. Um, we lived quite rural in the beginning. So there was incidences of people wanting to touch your skin or wanting to touch your hair, which I know is a very common experience for people of color in the West and in the UK as well, but at the same time, and this is why I think underdog is not a title that I would um, use for myself. Even as a nine years old, I was painfully aware of my light skin and white privilege in Kenya. And I think there's like one crucial point where this jumped into my conscious as a preteen child. So we were nine years old, it was the first Christmas in Kenya in the local school in Akuru that I went to. There was five white kids in that school. That was myself and my two sisters and then two missionary kids, um, a boy and a girl. And 
Christmas came and our teachers who were all black Kenyans put together a nativity play. And I was Mary, the missionary boy was Joseph and um, our sisters were the wise men. And it just didn't feel right. I, I wasn't old enough to put a name on it, but um, it just didn't feel right. I didn't understand why the five white kids of the school were that representation of the Holy Family and the white men. And I think that kicked off a realization of what white privilege actually means. And I'm quite privileged to have had that realization so early on in my life and to have been thinking about these topics for so long and um, so deeply. So marginalized, yes. On the margins, yes. But, you know, I'm in my mid thirties as well now. I've got a nice job. I have not been furloughed in lockdown. Um, I'm in a stable situation. I was lucky when I came to Wales to get funding and do a PhD. Last year, I, to my own surprise, successfully applied and became a trustee for the Arts Council, where I don't say what to do, but I get to try and influence. So I, 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 would, I would be mad to call myself an underdog. I would be mad to do that. Definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> okay, from in, in that case, moving on to what do you think, not being an underdog, but really understanding your privilege at an early age, what do you think you'll say that you're fighting for in your daily job because I know that young people and people from non-privileged backgrounds is is your passion to get them involved in your projects or get them funding is your passion or your work part of your work so um can you talk about that a little bit um yeah when I first started working at the museum my job interview there was a teenager there and it was actually that teenager who said, this is the candidate, this is the person, hire her. So from the beginning, I've been like, okay, I work for young people, that's what I do. I don't work for the museum, I work for young people. And the first year was a little bit of trial and error, finding your feet, but something that jumped out strongly is that young people do care about um, minority voices, they do care about the environment, they care about the future. So in my work at the museum, we have four broad themes. One of them is black colonial history and minority presentation, representation. Another one is the environment. Then we do a lot of work around LGBTQ history, experience and culture as well. And then the last one is really broad. It's cradle to grave. It's basically looking at social history, but also like everyday lived experiences um, then and now. And these are the themes that we've been working on for a long time. And then of course, um, with lockdown and Black Lives Matter really becoming this massive sweeping cultural shift that um, has swept across the world really and influenced a lot of institutions and countries differently. I'm happy to say that the museum has really thrown itself behind that. So because with young people, we were working on that theme beforehand. We were doing um, takeovers, reframing the collections, discussions, Black History Club on Zoom since the beginning of lockdown, all this kind of stuff. We've become more heard and more influential within the museum. And that's great. It's really good. At the same time, I don't want young people to be exploited. Um, the work that we have to do is really like high level stuff. And it's not enough to just say, oh, these young creators are going to help us. There has to be massive structural changes. So for me, I think structural change at the moment. I want to look at boring things like human resources, um, policies, uh, what counts as expertise and to get things like lived experience um, recognized as expertise because lived experience is a level of insight and understanding that no degree can get you. If you haven't lived certain things, you have to understand that maybe you're not the expert. And this is another thing. Um, I think at the moment as part of Black Lives Matter and what is required of everyone who feels they've kind of signed up and want to be on what is essentially the right side of history and supporting and making these changes happen is to think about their own position and something that's in history, in culture, in heritage, in language that goes across 
almost everything in kind of the Western cultural sphere is the normalization of whiteness. So the idea that if you are able-bodied, if you are of middle to upper income, and if you are white, and if you're a kind of educated bachelor, master degree upward, you are the definition of normal. And I think that is a very, very important thing to challenge. I'm also fighting for patience and to keep my cool and not freak out because a lot of work is required at the moment from a lot of us. And I know creators are having to actually put their practice down and be engaged in these conversations all the time. And it's really, really taxing. So I'm equally excited and terrified. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. Um thank you for that actually because our personal um fights are also important isn't it i know we're all i mean you you guys are all activists in a way and you are fighting to to change and make a change but trying to make a change in ourselves is also a whole fight in it in itself um so thanks for thanks for saying that that you are working on and fighting for your own patience and to be able to have that patience ongoing to keep doing what you're doing um and I think you've kind of touched upon this already. How does, um, how does your fight affect your work in art? So um, I'm just going to, I just want to encourage people to start getting their questions together while me and Sarah are sort of talking. No, we are going to talk about it. I just want to encourage yeah. people to um, focus and think about their quest questions so they can either raise their hands when we are done or put their questions in the chat. Um, yes, Sarah. So so my art um i've started writing last year i was um lucky enough to be one of the authors that got to contribute to way shameless self-promotion so oh, you yeah. know bye. i know um <laughs> i have got a friend in there as well yeah awesome parthian books we had our launch yesterday so i have a hangover because i was sitting here with my wine all dressed up and then that um, Zoom call ended and there was nowhere to go. Um, and I wrote a short kind of story essay for that book about growing up foreign in a foreign country. Um, that was republished in Wales Arts Review. So I'm going to stick the link to that into the chat. Mm -hmm. I also work outside the museum with um, the Welsh African Film Festival, Watch Africa Cymru. So we've moved a film festival into also doing production in Wales and in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is super exciting. When, because, is, when um, is that happening? Sorry to cut you off. Around October, but we're going to have to do online screenings this year. So it's going to be very, very scaled down. I'll also put the link to the website, which needs an update. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and I'm always stick in the youth facing email for the museum anyone who's under 25 i'm sorry about the ageism that's just the kind of guidelines of my job if you want to get in touch because you're creative and you want to kind of find out what we do at the museum that would be great as well and not just creative like writers, is there activity. is there programs or funds sorry to be really blunt but is there uh, yeah. programs or funding to support uh, creators under 25 right now okay awesome so, so yeah there's two strands and we have to update the website there's a youth forum which is more guided a little bit of a safe space um a lot of young people who are on the spectrum take part in that that's just kind of for young museum enthusiasts who want to do stuff uh -huh. and a little bit of like support and then there is the young heritage um, leaders but we're going to rename that to museum producers because it just sounds better and um that's basically a loose network of creators and we regularly, more or less regularly, send out opportunities to get involved. At the moment, I'm looking for young editors to join an arts publication. Um, we're working on an upcoming exhibition. There's another one about um, transformations and trans lives that we're preparing for Swansea for 2021. So, and those are paid opportunities as well as volunteering opportunities for um young people under 25 yeah amazing that that sounds all like really incredible i i feel like we do need to sort of um 
promote all of that, which I don't think many people are aware of. So we, or I, I maybe our audience or we not. So what no, I need to update the website. There's been so much going on and there's not enough visibility for our project. I completely agree. That's my bad. Well, what, let's, let's do this. Let's try and share it. We are happy to put it on our newsletters and then we'll put it on our, you know, all our in social media um, just as well. So um, same for Tanya and Tanika, but I think I've been in touch with you the least, in all honesty. So let's try and make that happen <laughs> um i think we sort of talked about this but unless you want to say anything and how it impacted your life please um do add a minute or two on this but i want to start taking questions in a couple of minutes because we're running out of time and this isn't a reflection on my speakers guys it's a reflection on me and my timing because it's the first time and I apologize if uh, anything feels rushed, but I don't want to um, extend our timing too much because, yeah, because <laughs> we already will be. Is there anything you want to add, Sarah, that do you think? Uh, no, I've already touched on Black Lives Matter. I guess something to add to that is, I mean, I'm being very positive. I hope people don't just suddenly forget when we come out of lockdown. And I hope that it's like, ongoing commitment for everyone including white people when they realize oh my god i have to challenge my own privilege i have to become a little bit less and i'm comfortable in order to you know improve the lives of people who've never really been comfortable so i hope that it's like an ongoing commitment for everyone and i also feel it's only the start i mean once we have hopefully begun to successfully deal with how we treat each other as humans we also have to start thinking about how we treat other living beings and like the planet as this amazing living thing that we're all living on because things are speeding up um, climate change is becoming ever more present in all our lives and it's all linked together people of color um african countries indian countries asian countries are disproportionately more affected by climate change and have already begun to feel the heavy, heavy impact. So it's all tied in together and it's a lot of work and I hope we're all on board for it. Yes, 100%. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so this is our massive, massive thank you. So everybody raise hand or unmute and clap or woohoo, whatever you want to contribute right now for all our speakers. I'm so impressed and I just wish we could uh, chat forever. <laughs> we could chat all day. I would love, love that.